Where last we left off, Rome was standing triumphant over the Samnites. They had almost utterly destroyed the Samnite army, somewhere in Samnium itself. The defeat was so terrible for the Samnites that they had immediately offered their surrender. This seems like a no-brainer for the Romans. They had won their war. Why would they not accept such a surrender? Well, we don't know, but they didn't. I told you at the end of the last episode, which you should probably check out before watching this one, that the Romans would come to regret this decision. This would happen at a small area in the Italian countryside, known as the Caudine Forks. What happened at the Caudine Forks? Why would Rome come to regret their decision to reject a surrender? And why do I call this one of, if not the most embarrassing defeat the Republic would face? Let's talk about it. We pick back up in 321 BCE. Rome had just finished their consular elections for the year, and the two consuls, Titus Fraternius Calvinus and Spurius Posthumius Albinus Caudinus, were sent into the fields of Campania to continue the war with the Samnites. The two made camp at a small town called Caladia, which was just about a day's distance away from Capua. Gaius Pontius, hard to tell if this is his actual name as it seems a little too Roman, commanded the Samnite army and made his camp at the Caudine Forks. The Caudine Forks, now called the Valle Caudina or Caudine Valley, is a valley located in Campania. The valley had been inhabited for centuries, even by 321 BCE, and served almost like a road for travelers, traders, and armies trying to go from one end of Campania to the other. Gaius knew this, and he used this reputation to his advantage. He knew that if he could somehow convince the Roman consuls that their armies were needed on the other side of Campania, or even somewhere else in Italy, there was a decent chance that they would march right through this valley. So, Gaius ordered a decent number of his soldiers, we're told anywhere from 10 to 20, to dress up as shepherds and pretend, or maybe even actually graze flocks in the fields around the town of Caladia. These fake shepherds were able to quickly cause a rumor to spread throughout the town that the Samnites would be moving to attack the city of Lucretia in Apua. Lucretia happened to be a Roman ally, and eventually this rumor reached the Roman encampment. The consuls believed that they needed to march to the aid of the city. Not only was the city an ally, but if the Samnites were attacking the city, then it was extremely likely that it would be with their full strength. What use was sitting in a camp when the action was occurring on the other side of the peninsula? So the consuls ordered the army to march towards the city of Lucretia, and just as Gaius had hoped, the consuls decided to march through the Caudine Valley. To enter into the main valley, the Romans first had to pass through two defiles, essentially a narrow pass or gorge whereby the army could only march in a narrow column. These defiles gave the Samnites the perfect opportunity to trap the Romans. The Samnites allowed the Romans to march through the first one unhindered. However, when the Romans exited the first defile, they emerged into a small, narrow ravine. This ravine served as a passage between the first and the second defile. The Romans quickly made their way to the second defile, but found it barricaded. Instantly, the Romans knew something was wrong. This was a well-traveled road, and any natural barrier would likely have been reported and cleared by now. The consuls ordered the army to turn around and make haste back into the first defile. However, the Samnites got there first. You see, Gaius had split his force up. One half went to the second defile, where they set up the aforementioned barricade along with a strongly fortified camp, while the other half stayed hidden in the trees and wilderness along the first defile. And when the Romans had fully exited the area, they quickly went to work setting up their own camp, along with a totally new barricade at the exit of the first defile. This meant that the Romans were trapped. On two sides stood the imposing natural terrain, a rocky, mountainous, and completely inhospitable environment, while on their other two sides, a formidable army of Samnites were encamped in naturally defensible positions. The situation was hopeless, and the Romans knew it. The Samnites now held the Roman army at their mercy, and the Romans didn't really have the morale to put up much of a fight. And even if they did, what were they going to do? They couldn't get out of the ravine via the terrain. If they charged their full force at one of the defiles, then they risked being attacked from their rear as soon as the fighting at their front started, an almost certainly hopeless position. And if they split the army up with one half attacking one defile and the other attacking the other, then they were numerically outnumbered and fighting a force that had dug in defensive positions. Oh, and did I mention that there was barely enough materials to set up a camp, much less a fortified encampment? and that the food was running low? The Romans were screwed, and they knew it. The ball was in the Samnite court, and it was up to Gaius to decide what to do. Gaius was hesitant to do anything, 
This was such a pivotal moment that if he made the wrong decision, not only could it risk the current war, but it could risk the Samnite state itself. Think about it. The Romans had been stomping the Samnites so far. Basically every battle was won by the Romans. It had been so bad that the Samnites offered to fully surrender to the Roman side. But the Romans were so successful that it blinded them and they decided to carry on. For all Gaius knew, their ultimate goal was to march right into Samnium, take Bavinium, and subjugate the Samnites. But Gaius had managed to turn it all around. At his mercy were the vast majority of Rome's fighting men, two consuls, and most, if not all, of Rome's senior military figures. Forget the war, this could end the Roman threat to the Samnites for a generation or more. So Gaius did the thing that I think a lot of people would do when faced with such an important dilemma. He wrote to his father. His father, a man named Herennius Pontius, was a retired Samnite statesman, who, while never being the head honcho, so to speak, had still been a respected member of the Samnite government. Herennius wrote back quickly, saying that the Romans should be sent on their way, completely unharmed. Gaius rejected this advice. Why should an enemy army be granted complete clemency? They had just been slaughtering Samnites, and now Gaius just let them go? That just wouldn't do. Gaius sent a return message asking him once again, what should I do? Herennius wrote back that he should slaughter the army, every single Roman should be put to the sword, and all of their belongings and supplies should be taken as tribute. Okay, what the hell just happened? Herennius goes from saying you should let them go, to kill every single one of them and then loot their corpses? Well, Gaius was just as confused as the rest of us, so he summoned his father to the forks to speak in person. Herennius made his way to the valley with all haste and was quickly ushered into the Samnite camp to speak with his son, where I assume Gaius said something along the lines of what the hell. Herennius repeated his advice, but he elaborated this time. If Gaius let the army leave unhindered, he would likely secure Roman friendship for a generation or more. Not only would the consuls be grateful for being spared, but so would the average soldier, and so would the families of those soldiers back in Rome. If Gaius killed the army to a man, then he would cripple the Roman war machine for a generation to come. Most of Rome's fighting men would be dead, their senior military figures would also be dead, and Rome's war machine would be completely and utterly crippled. In fact, there would have been a pretty good chance that someone like the Etruscans or the Gauls would have come in from the north and at least regained some of the losses they had suffered in the past few decades slash centuries. This would have put Rome back quite a few steps in their empire building project and may have even completely ruined the state. Suddenly, Herennius' advice makes a lot more sense. Gaius stood at a crossroads. He could either secure Rome's friendship and hope that that was enough to save the Samnite state, or he could cripple the Roman war machine and hope that it was enough to stunt or even reverse Rome's rise. Gaius, though, was apparently aghast at these options. They seemed extreme, and to be honest, he was right. These options were extreme, War sometimes requires extreme choices. Herennius knew this, but apparently Gaius did not. Gaius asked about a middle path of letting the army go but imposing terms of defeat on Rome, and Herennius replied with a great line, saying this, quote, That is just the policy which neither procures friends nor rids us of enemies. Once let men, whom you have exasperated by ignominious treatment, live, and you will find out your mistake. The Romans are a nation who know not how to remain quiet under defeat. Whatever disgrace this present extremity burns into their souls will rankle there forever and will allow them no rest till they have made you pay for it many times over." Well, Gaius ignored his dad. Seems a bit odd considering Gaius asked him for advice, but oh well. Gaius decided that he would demand the Romans surrender and that they quote, evacuate the Samnite territory and withdraw their colonies. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. Just wait a moment. The consuls, though, had no choice. It was either agree to these terms or die fighting a battle they simply could not win. The few attempts they had made to break out had been completely unsuccessful, and their food supply was dwindling quickly. The Romans surrendered and exited their hastily made camp completely unarmed. Gaius, though, was not quite done. Apparently, he decided to completely ignore his father's advice and give a little bit more humiliation to the Romans. He ordered a yoke to be constructed. A yoke, at least literally, is a wooden beam typically placed across the shoulders of various beasts of burden that enables them to pull the load together. This essentially makes the animals work as a group instead of alone and allows them to pull much heavier loads. 
Symbolically though, the yoke had, and still does, represent subservience, which makes a lot of sense when you consider the actual purpose of a real yoke. It was actually surprisingly common for the Romans and the Samnites to force prisoners to walk under a yoke before they were released, as a sort of ritual of subservience and as proof that the other side had triumphed. So with all of this in mind, the Samnites constructed a yoke made of two spears shoved into the ground and a third tied across. The third spear was just low enough that the Romans had to bend their head down to comfortably clear it. Already this was extremely humiliating, but to add insult to injury, the entirety of the Samnite force stood in two columns on either side of the yoke, and as the Romans walked forward to face their turn, the Samnites hurled jeers and taunts and had their swords pointed directly at the Romans. Livy tells us that some Romans were so indignant at their treatment that some Samnite soldiers took offense and killed them where they stood. When the Roman army had finally made their way past their humiliation, they were not quite sure what to do. Yes, they could make it back to Capua before nightfall. Capua was a city allied to the Romans, and a city that should have offered the army whatever they needed. But Livy tells us that the army was so ashamed and fearful of how their allies in Rome itself would respond to the punishment they had just suffered, that they kind of just stood there. The army basically just sat on both sides of the road. Despair and hopelessness overcame everyone from the lowest legionnaire all the way up to the two consuls. Eventually, Capua received word of the army and their humiliating defeat. The Capuans, though, were far more forgiving and accepting than the Romans thought they would be, and they held nothing against the defeated army. In fact, they rushed to supply the troops with their own stockpiled weapons and armor, and gave the two consuls the city's own insignia of office, along with properly equipping the lictors with new facetses. Yet, even as the city and the senate of Capua welcomed them with open arms, the Romans couldn't quite bring themselves to look the Capuans in the eye. So deep and painful were the feelings of despair and defeat. A few young noblemen from Capua would be tasked with escorting the army to the frontier with the Romans, and yet, as the army marched, they were completely silent. No salutations were returned, nor were any salutes, and even the Roman heads seemed to still be bowed, as though they were still walking under the yoke. Livy leaves us with a beautiful quote that captures what the Romans were feeling. The Samnites had won, not only a glorious victory, but a lasting one. They had not only captured Rome as the Gauls had done before them, but what was still a more warlike exploit, they had captured the Roman courage and hardihood. However, not all was lost. As Ophilus Calavus, a Campanian noble, told the Capuan Senate, quote, The truth is far otherwise. That stubborn silence, those eyes fixed on the ground, those ears deaf to all consolation, that shame faced shrinking from the light, are all indications of a terrible resentment fermenting in their hearts, which will break out in vengeance. Either I know nothing of the Roman character, or that silence will soon call forth amongst the Samnites cries of distress and groans of anguish. The memory of the capitulation of Cadium will be much more bitter to the Samnites than to the Romans. Whenever and wherever they meet, each side will be animated by its own courage, and the Samnites will not find the Caudine Forks everywhere. Back in Rome, though, the news was just starting to sink in. At first, the city had begun to raise as many troops as they could, with the hope of rushing to the aid of the entrapped army. However, before the army could even be fully organized, news reached the capital of the horrible fate the Roman army had been forced to undergo. The Romans were in shock. How could their army, the army of the Republic, have done something so horrid? Why had they not fought to the last man instead of allowing such a humiliating action to befall the Republic? Didn't they understand that their actions and humiliation reflected not only on their army, but the country and the people as a whole? That shock quickly turned to anger. Rome went into mourning. The booths around the forum were shut up. All public business in the forum ceased. The senators laid aside their purple striped tunics and gold rings. The gloom amongst the citizens was almost greater than that in the army. And yet, Underneath it all, feelings of resent and hatefulness thrived. Everyone in the army, from the consuls to the officers, and even to the common soldier, were resented. There was even talk of not allowing them to return into the borders of the city. This changed, though, when the army itself arrived. Livy tells us that the army arrived looking not as a group returning to the safety of their city, but as prisoners. Every single man refused to look anyone in the eye. No salutes were given. No rituals or common practices were observed. Instead, the men marched straight to their homes, where they shut their doors and remained there for days, almost as though they were living in a sort of exile. 
Even the consuls refused to undertake any of the public duties they were responsible for. Eventually, though, the time for elections came about, and the consuls were forced to break their silence. Together, they nominated Publius Aelius Paetus and Quintus Fabius Ambustus to oversee the elections. However, the Romans were unable to hold elections for the year, as the people simply refused to vote. Such was their dissatisfaction with the consuls and the conduct of the army. Because of this, an interregnum was declared, and for a year or so, the Roman government was essentially in limbo. Eventually, Quinticus Publius Philo and Lucius Papirius Cursor were both elected consuls. Those names probably sound extremely familiar, and they should. If they don't, maybe go back and check out part one. Both men had already taken part in the ongoing Samnite War, and both were highly respected generals. I'm sure the Romans likely hoped that the election of the two men, who had already succeeded against the Samnites, would push hostilities to resume, and the Romans might regain some portion of their lost prestige. But first, the issue of what had just happened had to be brought before the Senate, and the two former consuls needed to explain themselves. Spurius Postumus was the first to speak, and this is what he had to say. Quote, Consuls, I am quite aware that I have been called upon to speak first, not because I am foremost in honor, but because I am foremost in disgrace, and hold the position not of a senator, but of a man on his trial, who has to meet the charge not only of an unsuccessful war, but also of an ignominious peace. Since, however, you have not introduced the question of our guilt or punishment, I shall not enter upon a defense, which, in the presence of men not unacquainted with the mutability of human fortunes, would not be a very difficult one to undertake. I will state, in a few words, what I think about the question before us, and you will be able to judge from what I say whether it was myself or your legions that I spared when I pledged myself to the convention, however shameful or however necessary it was. This convention, however, was not made by the order of the Roman people, and therefore the Roman people are not bound by it, nor is anything due to the Samnites under its terms beyond our own persons. Let us be surrendered by the Fetiles, stripped and bound. Let us release the people from their religious obligations, if we have evolved them in any, so that without infringing any law, human or divine, we may resume a war which will be justified by the law of nations, and sanctioned by the gods. I advise that in the meantime, the consuls enroll and equip an army, and lead it forth to war, but that they do not cross the hostile frontier until all our obligations under the terms of surrender have been discharged. And you, immortal gods, I pray and beseech that as it was not your will that the consuls, Postumius and Venturus, should wage a successful war against the Samnites, you may at least deem it enough to have witnessed us sent under the yoke and compelled to submit to a shameful convention, enough to witness us surrendered, naked and in chains, to the enemy taking upon our heads the whole weight of his anger and vengeance. May it be, in accordance with your will, that the legions of Rome, under fresh consuls, should wage war against the Samnites, in the same way in which all wars were waged before we were consuls. God, I really do love reading that. I honestly recommend you all go read all of the speeches from Spurius Postumus in Livy's Ab Urbi Condata, as they are frankly incredible. The speech was so rousing and so inspiring that it set the Senate into a frenzy, and they were bang for Samnite blood. The Tribune of the Plebs, though, pointed out that as much as the Romans wanted to fight the Samnites, they had technically signed a peace treaty with the Samnites, a treaty that was agreed upon with an oath to the gods to uphold its terms. To go against the peace the treaty instituted would be to spit in the face of the gods. Did Rome really want to risk such an action? This caused the Senate to pause. To anger the gods was foolish, and they knew it. Spurius Postumus pointed out, however, that the treaty had actually been signed by the consuls and the senior military officials of the army, as they had refused to agree to a traditional treaty. A traditional treaty for the Romans involved the auspices being taken and the presence of the Fetiles, priests of Jupiter that served as a liaison between the gods and Rome in diplomatic matters. Essentially, Spurius said that the treaty bound himself, his fellow consul, and the other signatories, not the Roman people, nor the Senate. Because of this, Rome itself would be free to continue to war, just without those who had signed the treaty. In further penance for his actions, Spurius declared that he, along with Titus Calvanus, the other consul, would join the group of hostages sent to the Samnites. These hostages were meant to serve as guarantees for the treaty, 
and ensure that Rome did not resume hostilities. Spurius, along with an undetermined and undisclosed amount of people, left Rome, along with the Fetiles, to journey to the Samnites, and be formally handed over. We don't really know who all exactly was in the group, but we do know that Spurius and everyone who had signed the treaty were certainly there. In any case, the Fetiles brought the group before Gaius Pontius, where the Fetiles said, quote, For as much as these men have, without being ordered thereto by the Roman people, given their promise and oath that a treaty shall be concluded, and have thereby been guilty of high crime and misdemeanor. I do, herewith, make surrender to you of these men, to the end that the Roman people may be absolved from the guilt of a heinous and detestable act. Just as he finished his words, Spurius struck the fetile in the knee, and loudly proclaimed himself to be a Samnite citizen, which technically he would have been, as he had just been handed over as a hostage. A hostage was supposed to enjoy all the rights and privileges of a Samnite citizen, minus, of course, free movement. This was completely against the diplomatic rules of both the Samnites and the Romans. Fetals were considered sacrosanct, and no harm was to come to them in their missions. Gaius Pontius denounced the Roman scheme, and declared that the Romans had not surrendered their hostages, and so the treaty was null and void. Gaius actually goes on a great rant here, but it's way too long for me to read in its entirety. I'll leave a link to an online resource, where you can find the whole speech in the description. I really recommend you read it. In any case, the treaty was now voided on both sides, and war was free to resume. Now, it's pretty hard to say how much of this story is historically accurate. Most modern historians cast quite a bit of doubt on the authenticity of Livy's writings here. But there is no doubt that there was a truce during the period, 321 to about 319 or 316 BCE, depending on what exactly you consider a truce. There was no record of fighting in any of the sources, and it truly seems like the Romans and the Samnites did not fight during this period. Or if they did, no record survives to our time. But the events here are a little hard to believe. This time, our main question mark comes in the form of geography. The defiles in question are nowhere near as narrow as Livy makes them out to be. The western one, the one that the Romans entered, is about a kilometer or a little over half a freedom unit wide. Certainly not large, but also not small enough that an army would have struggled to pass through, and certainly large enough that it would have taken a considerable amount of time for the Samnites to have barricaded well enough to hold the Romans in. The distance from this western defile to the eastern one is only about four and a half kilometers, or just under three miles, which probably would have taken the Roman army about an hour and a half to cross one way, and then another hour and a half to cross back. So if we are generous, and say it took two hours both ways, then that gives the Samnites four hours to completely barricade a kilometer. Not impossible, but definitely difficult. I also find it rather difficult to believe that Gaius Pontius simply ignored his father's advice. He had written to his father twice, and then even asked him to come out to the camp and advise him in person, and he just decided to ignore him? And what's more, he decided to do the one thing his father said not to do, humiliate the Romans. I personally believe that, as is always the case with Livy, there is a kernel of truth and accurate history here. I do believe that the Samnites succeeded in some sense during the war, and that they were able to achieve a period of peace. That may have even involved humiliating the Romans in some fashion. I think the real issue here is with the geography. This is a picture of the defiles. Look at that. Do you really think the Romans couldn't have broken out of that? I firmly believe they could have. I think that there was almost certainly a battle here, and I think it almost certainly went bad for the Romans. So bad that it humiliated those that survived, and even the whole of the Roman state for a time. But I think Livy was forced to once again, shall we say, interpret some historical details. Remember, Livy was not a historian. I know that there are a few of you getting ready to go down to the comments and disagree, and look, that's completely fine, but go and really read Livy's work. Read how he describes the great Roman character, and how Rome was destined to be this great empire that would change the world, and come back and tell me it doesn't at least vaguely sound like Roman propaganda. This is not to say that we should simply discount Livy and all of his writings, or ignore everything the man had to say. Instead, we must read Livy with an extra set of eyes. We have to brush through his work with a fine-tooth comb, and try to read in between the lines. Livy was not just writing so that I can sit here and talk about his history some 2,000 years later. Livy was also writing to ingrain in Rome certain values, and to further the Roman identity. This story is not just history, 
or at least history as the Libby sees it, it's also a story of moderation and a lesson in revenge. Gaius Pontius had the chance to either gain Rome's friendship or to destroy the city's ability to wage war for a generation or more. While yes, those options are extreme. In war, extreme decisions must be made. Instead, Gaius chose a middle path, a path that would eventually spell defeat for the Samnites and result in Rome back on top. This is a lesson that sometimes in life, the only options are the extreme ones. The path of moderation is typically good, but sometimes it is the worst option. Further, Livy instills a sort of Roman spirit to rise back up from the beaten mess they found themselves in. The Romans pulled themselves back into a position of power after humiliating defeat, something that the Romans prided themselves on, and something that Livy, and those who sponsored him, were keen to reinforce. To be fair to the other side, I could be talking nonsense here. Livy could be completely right. The battle, or I guess really political agreement, of the Caudine Forks could be historically accurate. But, frankly, we will never know for sure. But let me know what you think in the comments. Was Livy completely accurate? Did he make some creative liberties? Or is he just completely making everything up? In any case, we are now in the year 319 BCE, and the war is about to get going again. Rome had come to regret their decision to ignore the Samnite offer of surrender, and were now, one way or another, humiliated. And yet, they were still kicking something the Samnites were about to get a reminder of. Join me next time as we finally wrap up the Second Samnite War. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. I hope this all made sense. I really wanted to expose you to the way Livy tells us these events happened before questioning it, as I think you really have to see the events as a whole rather than as pieces to truly attempt to find the truth. I'm sorry if it was a little jarring to switch back to question mode, but hopefully it was alright. I also want to apologize for going MIA. I had a bit of sickness and a bit of burnout, along with Thanksgiving, and it all just sort of lined up in a row. But I'm back now, and we are also going to be going back to three videos a week, so be on the lookout for future videos. If you have any comments or questions on the video, or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below, and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. It really helps the channel out. Peace.